Well, isn't it nice to know that there are people out there doing wonderful work? <clears throat> Stanley B. Goldenberg, a guy with lots of energy and lots of nerve. He actually goes out and looks at these damn hurricanes up close. At least that's what I read. Is that true? He gets in the plane and takes a ride, and then he bumps around inside of those things, and he comes back, and he says, you know, that was, that was one of those whirling clouds, wasn't it? Stanley, is a, he's a meteorologist at the Hurricane Research Center in Florida. Uh, he's also been a research scientist at the University of Washington, and he uh, taught, I think this is a very interesting uh, reference that I got off uh, one of these internet Uh-oh. things. Uh, he <laughs> taught at Messianic Jewish Academy, which means that okay. He is a teacher at heart, and uh, he's here to teach us a little bit about hurricanes, and he particularly has played a kind of a central role in the issue of uh, do El, El Ninos or La Ninas cause an increase or a decrease in hurricanes, and, and since the boys in, in Florida are our hurricane counters and studiers, um, I think it's a wonderful thing that Stanley could be here and that he will uh, discuss with you his favorite area, bumpy, circular cloud things. <laughs> I'll tell you, it sure beats reading just a bio. Uh, <laughs> that's not what I wrote, was it? Uh, real quickly here, for those who know what it is, Chag uh, Sameach, Happy Purim tonight. And uh, that starts this evening. And I have, uh, I have to introduce them, two of my daughters, two of eight daughters with me. I also have three sons. Uh, but uh, why don't you all stand up? That's Pearl and Bethany. They're 16 and 14. <laughs> Thank you. And Pearl is very famous because she was born the night of Hurricane Andrew. She was born, oh, they didn't even get my talk ready. There you go. Okay. How do I do this? Uh, oh, I, oh, it should? Okay, right there. There we go. And then I press on. Yes, I got it. Okay. Is that better? And uh, she was born 12 hours before the eye wall hit Miami and totally destroyed our house. I left the hospital to go home to be with my three boys, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, their three boys, and our house was ripped apart on top of us. Uh, the hospital, thankfully, was right out of the devastation area, and they still had a pretty bad storm, but nothing like what we had. And uh, so I didn't see her for about 24, 36 more hours. And, uh, but that story's been on umpteen TV specials. <laughs> so next time you'll tune in, you'll see Andrew's stuff, and you'll say, wait, wait, I remember that guy. Uh, but anyway, just to mention, I did uh, bring some handouts. I did a uh, PowerPoint printout of my talk. Uh, a few slides are slightly different. I changed a few things since it came out. And on the back of it are a couple extra sheets, like my favorite list of all sorts of nice, helpful links on the other side of the global warming issue that I give out to people all the time. And then there's just some fun hurricane stuff over there. There's plenty of copies. So, uh, but uh, you want to pass them all? <laughs> yeah, there's not enough of the other stuff. But uh, may I make a suggestion? Just pass around the talk and let people get the other stuff later. And uh, I'll tell you, one of, I put this in the talk. I have also pictures. It's a diagram of what the plane is, the hurricane plane, and all the instruments bring home for your kids. And I didn't put this in the talk, but this is Floyd versus Andrew. And you can pretty much see it from back there. Andrew's the tiny one. This is the same scale, virtually the same strength, and same location. Thankfully, Floyd turned, went up north, caused tremendous flooding. But if it had hit Miami, it would have dwarfed the devastation from Hurricane Andrew. And a lot of these devastating storms we've seen recently, none of them are the worst case scenario. None of them. All of them could be much worse. And it doesn't take global warming, just a little shift in track, a little change in intensity. And uh, like the other speaker said, I'm not here officially representing NOAA, but this is much of this is NOAA research. And I'd love to show more pretty hurricane pics, but I want to get into some of the science. I feel like I'm in a medical session here. But uh, we're going to deal with meteorology. And I wanted you to really get an idea of why. Now listen to this. Not a single, to my knowledge, not a single scientist at the National Hurricane Center, the Hurricane Research Division, the Joint Typhoon Warning Center, I'm trying to find out about the Central Pacific Hurricane Center, believe that hurricanes, numbers, activity, that there's any measurable impact from any so-called global warming. 
Uh, there's a reason for that, even though there's other scientists out there that feel that way. Now, now this is preaching to the choir, but, but when I give this talk at other science meetings, I have to explain what I mean by global warming, because I am talking about it in my talk, and basically, AGW, anthropogenic global warming, otherwise called Al Gore warming, uh, uh, is not the same as global warming, is not the same as climate change. And just because the Earth is worn, according to some measurements, about 0.7 degrees in the last 100 years, uh, my son, one of my sons did a survey uh, for a class, and he asked people, how much do you think it's warmed? And I mean, he got to 20 degrees, 10 degrees. I mean, people think it's got to be these huge numbers. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't mean that it's Al Gore warming, anthropogenic global warming. Just because climate change has happened doesn't mean AGW. Just because weather disasters happen doesn't mean AGW. And an inconvenient truth, and most of the media are speaking of CAGW. That's very important. They're not talking about just AGW. They're talking about catastrophic. If we just have a little bit of warming from man-made causes, nobody really cares. But they're talking about that's going to be catastrophic. And the fact is, as you all know <laughs> from this conference, there's numerous scientists who don't believe this. So we'll skip that because we all know that. And the debate, as you also know, is masked by media censorship, bias, and distortion. I'm interviewed quite a bit on many, many levels. And thankfully, most of our interviews are benign. They're, they're on our side. They're trying to get out to the public. But when we touch this area, I've seen gross, gross, blatant censorship. Anybody from the media, I'd be glad to argue with you about a firsthand experience. I challenge anybody from a mainstream media source to take and print a positive report on this conference. They won't get it past the editor. If they do, miracles do happen. It's poor. Uh, as far as hurricane activity, we have seen a observed, if the observations are right, a long-term warming trend in the tropical oceans. And so I'll simply refer to that as global warming throughout the rest of the talk without saying what the cause is. The few proje future projections are, of course, based on the global climate model results with increased CO2. And let me say something about El Nino forecast. Now, uh, my major professor, I don't know if he's, he's James O'Brien is giving a talk uh, in the next session somewhere. And uh, he was like one of the Mr. El Ninos, talking about El Nino before most of the public knew what it was. And I did some of my research under him. And uh, the issue is right now, with all the money, all the different models that are out there, there's not a single climate model that can reliably predict an El Nino occurrence even one to two months in advance. Now, those are climate models. We're not talking about weather models. One to two months in advance. In fact, we had a situation where we put out our NOAA forecast. This is the truth. And beginning of August, we were updating it for the seasonal outlook for the hurricane activity. And uh, we based it on that it was going to be a neutral El Nino, not El Nino, not La Nina season. Within two weeks, they had officially declared an El Nino. And we were scandalized. So didn't anybody know this was going to happen? I mean, the forecasts are atrocious. I'm not saying they're worthless. They're learning more. But as of now, those climate models cannot predict this massive, well-known, well-studied phenomena that we have a lot of historical record on with any reliability. Occasionally, they get it right. Uh, historical results here are based on attempted associations between observed historical long-term warming trend, whether it be natural, man-made, or a combination of the two, and we're wondering are the current levels of activity affected by global warming. Now, this is the key issue here. When you see all these studies, is the problems with using the historical tropical cyclone database. So let me make your eyes cross with all this stuff. First, you have the temporal, the time scale, non-homogeneity. You have new observational platforms and tools continually added out there. Uh, prior to 1944, you only had chip observations and, of course, island and land observations. But out there over the water, you just had chip observations, when they measured them, how they might have reported them. And frankly, the ships usually try and avoid the storms, okay? So they're not going to be out there measuring a Cat 5 storm at sea and live to tell about it normally or know that it was for sure a Cat 5. Uh, the aircraft reconnaissance aircraft, 44 to present, uh, they did fly for a while in the West Pacific uh, Basin. They don't routinely fly there, so they only sampled that for a little while with the planes. And believe me, we see constant comparisons between what we see from the satellite and what we see when we go out there on the planes, and it is radically different many times. Now, the satellites are our best tool we can use. We don't have the plane out there, but we always would choose the plane over the satellite when possible. Bill Gray fought against efforts to get rid of the reconnaissance program. Let's save a lot of money. We got all the satellites, and all we could tell them was in situ, right there, 
measurements is much different than trying to do with the satellite. We're grateful for the satellites, but they don't replace the planes. Planes don't replace the satellite. But the aircraft equipment is constantly changing and improving. In, in just the past five years, we add tool after tool after tool, and the interpretation of the data is constantly changing. When Andrew hit in 1992, they declared it was a Category 4 hurricane. Ten years later, not based on new data, just a new understanding of how to interpret the data, the, uh, they change it to a Category 5. And uh, I happened to be in uh, Hurricane Katrina. I flew it on the landfall flight, and I was actually processing the drop zones that were measuring the winds at the surface, and we were getting Category 3. The Hurricane Center said Category 4. I shut my mouth. I thought, well, they're looking at other data besides ours. Well, two months later, they changed it to Category 3. I mean, this is, there's a lot that goes into this, and that's part of my expertise. It's not just publishing and writing. Is the idea that I've seen how the data is taken. I know how it's processed. I know how we interpret it, and therefore how careful you have to be in using it. Uh, there are improvements to the land observations, the addition of satellite observations, and continually monitored starting in 66. But believe me, new satellites, they're changing, changing every year. Let's see if I can get through more of the talk here. Spatial non-homogeneity. I'm just going to quickly whiz through this. The data quality changes between basin and basin. Even uh, within the basin, it's different. Satellite coverage used to be far from uniform. Even in the Atlantic Basin, you couldn't see stuff all the way to the east because there weren't as many satellites. Uh, many of the alleged global warming-related increases or trends in the data tend to match exactly these changes in the observational tools. And the similar trends don't, I mean, this is the key thing here. Yes, CO2 is going up, temperatures for a period go up. That doesn't mean cause and effect. And just because the SSTs are going up, we have an increase in the population in Florida. I don't know if those are related. Okay, what controls the hurricane activity in the Atlantic? Lots of things, not the sea surface temperature. In particular, we have VZ, which would be vertical wind shear. And that's one of the most important effects. You can have everything else favorable. If vertical wind shield is unfavorable. You aren't going to get a hurricane. And what it is is the difference between the upper and the lower level winds. When that difference is relatively light, the hurricane can organize in the vertical. When it's strong, it rips the storm apart, kind of decapitates it, and then there's all points in between. You've got to have favorable vertical shear. Okay, what's happened with the tropical cyclone activity in the Atlantic? Uh, we use uh, several parameters that are kind of an overall measure of activity. Net tropical cyclone activity, NTC, and there's ACE, which is accumulated cyclone energy. Both of them uh, will say 100% is about average. So for the Atlantic from 1950 to 2008, I have to keep extending this out, uh, this is average right here. Green is below average. And you can see there was a period with a lot of above average years, and above this pink line we call that hyperactive. I have 11 kids. I can talk about hyperactive. And, uh, and then you hit a period here, not a single year, and this was very well observed here, not a single year, there was hyperactive, hardly anything above average, and in 95 you switch back again. That sure looks like a cycle to me. Now notice that if you're honest, you'll say this looks a lot more active than this back here. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, What's causing this? What's it associated with? If, and this is a paper we published in Science, actually got in Science, front cover in 2001, got a lot of press uh, with Bill Gray, with Chris Lancey, Alberto Messis Nunez. And uh, basically you have high activity air, low activity air associated with changes in the sea surface temperature. This is actually what's called an empirical orthogonal function analysis. But what that does, and I'll mention it later, it pulls out modes of variability within the data. So you see the different ways the data is changing, what's causing different changes. And again, you have several decades of warmer than normal, several decades of colder than normal temperatures, and those are associated with these changes. This isn't a trend. These are cycles, multidecadal cycles. But increased sea surface temperatures do not automatically mean more hurricanes, especially more of the major hurricanes. It takes changes in the atmospheric circulation. Uh, in fact, we did a paper uh, years ago with Dr. Shapiro that showed that the direct local effect of the SST, in other words, how warm it is under the storm, account, those changes account for only 10% of the variability of activity. It's the atmospheric circulation that means a lot more. 
And in fact, in 2006, it was the second highest observed sea surface temperature on record in the main development region, right in the tropics in the Atlantic. And it was almost as high as 2005. And the amount of uh, uh, activity was just basically average compared to 2005, which is about two and a half times average. And in 1997, a super El Nino year, which created very high vertical shear, you still had sea surface temperature in the Atlantic above average, but you didn't have high hurricane. And, and the reason that's so important is their mentality is if sea surface temperatures are getting warmer, that feeds the hurricanes, more hurricanes. But that's only a very, very small part of the picture. And uh, this is just an example of the vertical shear. It's kind of flipped because this is the size of the area of favorable shear, very low shear. So for these 20 years, 50s and 60s, you had a very large area of favorable, weak shear, and you had high activity era. Then you had um, a small area of weak shear, and you had low activity, and then we're back to this high activity era again uh, recently. So it's the shear associated with these changes in ocean circulation that's doing it. Uh, now, let me quickly uh, hit the end of the science article. This is actually stapled to the back of that handout, so you can read it yourself later. But w sure, we saw there was a long-term trend in ocean temperatures in that main development region. And we could say, yes, maybe this increase, uh, this recent increase is in part due for those increases in sea surface temperatures. Uh, but also, it could be due to the better observational network in place. And all the research we've done recently has said it's the observations that have changed radically that we're able to see. Now there's been some very rigorous studies that have done that. And in the, uh, uh, oh, I'll just mention from the science article, I mean, these recent disasters we've been having have not been a surprise. I mean, they're horrible disasters, but we expected this great increase in activity due to the shift to the favorable era. Um, and I'm going to, last five minutes, whiz through some of the debate that's been raging back and forth. Uh, there, basically, after we published that science article, all of a sudden there started coming out some talks and some people and scientists, well-known scientists. I remember at the beginning it was a shock to people like Chris Lancey and I that these very known names would say things that we considered, frankly, so ridiculous uh, and a bad interpretation of the data that all this activity was caused by these long-term trends and I'm going to just skip some of the stuff. There was tendency, of course, some in the media, some scientific circles to attribute almost any increase, increase in natural disasters to anthropogenic global warming. If it's bad, it must be global warming. And then there was a few prominent scientists that started to push it. And then the key thing in 2005, two published articles in Nature and Science that started to attribute this increase in activity. And uh, this is just from Katrina. You know, I mean, why was Katrina a disaster? Was it because it was such a strong storm, or was it the levees? Uh, the same storm hitting somewhere else would not cause that type of disaster. This is from inside the eye of Hurricane Katrina, our, our flight that night. Uh, you know, you look recently at the Bay of Bengal hur hurricane that hit this last year, 100,000 deaths. 100,000 deaths, and who came out immediately, of course, and blamed on global warming? You know, Al Gore, we knew that would happen. Well, he forgot history, and if you look back, 1991 had even more deaths, 77 had comparable deaths, and then you had 1970 with half a million deaths. So really, you look down, and global warming is reducing the threat of <laughs> hurricanes in that area. But uh, let me just mention something from these articles that came out, and I'll have to skip some of this. You'll have it in your uh, handout, and you can look, because there's a lot of technical stuff, and some of you absorb it, some won't. But just to give you an idea, and if I go two minutes over, he won't throw a shoe at me, but uh, is that the Webster, one of the articles was Webster uh, et al., came out in Science in 2000, oh, Science in 2005, and he analyzed the global category four and five hurricanes. And he said basically that they doubled over the last 35 years. So he showed, yeah, look, the sea surface temperatures are going up, and here's, you know, no change in category one, no change in twos and threes, no change in the maximum wind speed, but the category fives doubled in this period of time. Well, there was a, oh, incredible result. The media went all over it, and no increase in any other parameter. But the interesting thing is, in the last 15 years, that level has stayed just the same. Well, the secret is that, first of all, just because it's published doesn't make it true. I think some of you know that, especially science and nature. Uh, the 
scientific meteorological hurricane community went all over him. They saw so many problems in their paper. There was articles published against it, but the main thing is even just peer discussion, just people saying there's this error and this error and this error. Uh, you sit there and in 1970, he started in 1970 because he said, well, that's when satellite data started. But the quality and the way we analyze it changed tremendously since 1970. This is the key, the Dvorak infrared technique to analyze the infrared satellite data only got introduced around 1988-89 globally. That's when it flattened out. In other words, all of a sudden they started in, um, analyzing all these storms and then it just leveled off globally. So he was really seeing a change in that. Plus, he started at a low point in both the North Atlantic hurricane activity and the West Pacific activity. In other words, they were both stronger before 1970, so he was getting the low point of the cycle and seeing just this increase of the cycle. And uh, we kind of talked about that already. He had problem with the use of the data in almost all of the tropical cyclone basins. And I'm gonna skip a little bit here. Excuse me. This just talks about, and again, this is in the, the handout here. Uh, Carrie Emanuel came out with stuff, showed this huge increase, I'm sorry, huge increase in another index, the cube of the wind speed, and said, look at this massive, got to publish in Nature, got tremendous. This is uh, something that I believe Lyndon talked about the first night. And then Lancey published back at him and showed that he had analyzed it wrong, didn't filter the endpoints right, suppressed the, I mean, all sorts of problems with that. And thankfully, that was published as a comment. And uh, I'm just going to get to my, oh, this, this just shows as far as the measurements. You just sit there and look, and here's the 2005 season, 1933, almost just as active. What were they measuring out here? We didn't have satellite. You didn't have a lot of ship reports. You didn't have the reconnaissance. Maybe there was a lot of activity. You didn't measure the stuff back then. And uh, I'll get to. Just one more, and then I'll give you the conclusion, is that the, if you look at the raw tropical storm and hurricane numbers over a century, you get a, a trend. The problem is, again, the observational network was so different here. And when Lancey accounted, this is something in submission, paper in submission, accounted for the fact they didn't measure the short-lived storms, they didn't measure all these data areas, and then went back. And you can't do this perfectly. You can never prove this absolutely because you can't go back and fill in that data. But you use some rigorous scientific methods when he did that, the trend totally disappeared. And uh, anyway, I'll just summarize it. The historical studies that carefully use the reliable parts of the historical record find no discernible trend in any measurement of tropical cyclone uh, activity in any basin or globally. Uh, the future model projections, now there are some model projections that say you know, you're gonna have increased vertical shear, maybe fewer North Atlantic hurricanes, uh, maybe some stronger storms, but these are models. And I, will I don't know how much I trust those. Yeah, you know, what does it matter to people? You've gotta get ready for hurricanes, period. If I tell you this storm is coming at you because of global warming, or this storm is just coming at you, you've gotta get ready and really deal with uh, preparedness. Thank you very much.